Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Work Comp Matters. This week we are unequivocally off the charts as I am joined by my special guest, workers' compensation extraordinaire attorney, Saul Allweiss. Saul and I discuss alternative dispute resolution, workers' compensation carve-outs, dealing with opposing counsel, evaluating evidence, deposing doctors, and deposing applicants. In addition to Ted and Mike, we also have another report from the madman across the water, retired attorney John Scalia, all the way from Munich, Germany. And now, here's the show. Stand by SOT1. Standing. 10 seconds. Ready, rolling. Ready, SOT1. Ready. In four, three, two, one, roll in. From the round table at Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California, welcome to another edition of Work on Matters, the central location for you employees, you employers, and of course, we haven't forgotten about you independent contractors. My name is Steve Appel, and I'll be your host for the next hour with some talk, news, and hopefully some answers about Work on Matters. Thanks for being part of the show, and if you can break away from your Work on Matters, feel free to give us a call and clue us in with your questions, comments, and or concerns. The phone number worldwide, 818-357-4120. You can send me an email to wcexaminer at aol.com. Heck, you can be old school. Send me a fax, 818 475 one four three seven. With me in studio, my right hand man, Dr. Michael Zima, the best dressed man, Ted Durden, workers' compensation attorney for four decades, Saul Allweiss, Scott Walton of Uncle Studio is on the board, retired attorney John Scalia back in Munich, Germany, back at Work Comp Central, making sure the whole damn thing goes right. Is Ms. Christine Chavez? Well, good evening. Everybody, this is going to be awesome. We are brought to you by A1 Law. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system in the damn Kuiper Belt, give me a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guarantee, $1 a day, A1 Law. And if you want the number one online location for workers' compensation, blogging, credits, uh, the whole ball of wax education, check out workcompcentral.com. And if you want those hard to get sold out, even front row, concert, sports, theater tickets, give our buddy Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587. Well, like I said tonight, folks, we are off the charts. My guest has been involved in the California workers' compensation community for nearly four decades. He began as a claims examiner, supervisor, hearing representative at various insurers and self-insured entities. He attended the law school of the University of Laverne College of Law and passed the California bar in 1994. He started his legal career as claims counsel for Republic Indemnity, working on high profile cases and was responsible for setting policy and coordinating the activities of the claims department with other departments of the company. And he uh, conducted training statewide for the claims staff. In October 2002, he hung his own shingle, opened up his own practice, focusing on defense of workers' compensation claims. He also serves as a consultant on California legislative and regulatory matters and has been retained as an expert in first-party bad faith litigation, uh, compliance, audits conducted by the Division of Workers' Compensation and the Department of Insurance. He has served on numerous ad hoc legislative committees and in 2006 was named Workers' Compensation Defense Attorney of the Year by the State Bar of California. It's my pleasure and my pl- privilege to welcome to Work Comp Matters attorney Saul Allweiss. Thank you for having me, Steve. It's my pleasure. How do you how you doing and how do you like Uncle Studios? 
Oh, you got quite a great setup here. Yeah, it's it's a good place to uh, uh, stretch out. So thanks a lot for coming in. We just finished up the uh, instructional video, and that should be out shortly. And uh, I, I appreciate you spending your valuable time coming in. So, you know, in doing my research, I got to tell you, you, you have to be the most well-liked workers' compensation attorney uh, in the field. I, I asked around. Everybody respects you. Everybody appreciates your experience. They enjoy dealing with you. I mean, I tried real hard to find out something negative about you, and I just couldn't from anybody else. Now, of course, me. I saw something about you that, in my opinion, is absolutely the worst of anybody I've seen. Okay? Now, folks, get ready for this. The law office of Saul Allweiss has has to have the worst looking website I've ever seen. Okay, <laughs> dude, you, you got to get a hold of Jared, the IT guy. Okay, I, uh, we said that you uh, you've been in this for four decades. You developed the, the the website like about three decades ago or something like that. Yeah, I'm quite a dinosaur when it comes to things like that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting about the computer technology. Uh, I want uh, 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 last year. I interviewed Don Tobin on the Don Tobin interview, and I talked to him briefly about the technology in workers' compensation or for being an attorney and reviewing files. Scott, go ahead and play the clip from Don Tobin. Yeah, the computer technology, I've noticed it uh, from the new attorneys that uh, have come down the pipe. They have a screen, and they're reading off of a screen. They don't have the file in front of them. They're not going page by page and taking out pages that they need. Uh, and so that what they do is they have to read a screen and remember everything that's on it. And they don't have any way to deal with issues that come up because they can't make marks on it. It's just, a, it's not, a, I've never felt that that was a good way to practice law. Uh, do you equate it somewhat to top sheeting? Oh, yeah. And they're probably going to miss something because they're just reviewing what the last person said. Absolutely. Um, do you agree with Don that when you review a file, you do not review a prior attorney's notes or, or deal with it through uh, the computer? You go right into the hard file and the actual paper? Yeah. I, as I said before, I'm a dinosaur and I still need my hard file. I'm struggling with that. I realize that I am going to have to become paperless, and I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to get there. Well, firstly, of course, i got to ask you, and I don't know, do you use A1 Law? Uh, sadly, no. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, do you have any computer management system in your office? Yes, we do. Okay. Well, <laughs> tell you what, if you ever get tired of that, you come you come to me, and I'll take you to A1 Law, and I'll give you a money-back guarantee. One dollar a day, pal. Okay? I know I'm a pimp for A1 Law. But... Uh, in, in being totally um, paperless, even though I have A1 law, I don't like being totally paperless. I like semi-paperless. Uh, I like having the hard file there and going into the paper when I need it. But it's always nice that if I don't have to have that big, thick file, I can just check the notes in the computer and it's okay. Uh, but I always try and bring the file uh, to court uh, I remember when I started out in workers' compensation almost 30 years now, uh, basically we did reserve changes on paper. And, of course, as time resolved, uh, as time went by and computers became more a part of workers' compensation, I did my best to use it to my advantage. Being a defense attorney... Uh, I'm assuming you get a lot of documents from your client through, like, email, and also maybe you get social media uh, information and or Sabrosa. Do you have other people in your office review that, or do you look at that? Or um, Well, I'm a very small boutique practice, so I, I have a partner and a number of associates, but I actually personally review everything that comes in and everything that goes out. But when you talk about technology, as much as I claim to be a dinosaur, I think you know we're on the cusp of a lot of major changes in our world. Uh, one area where I think we're totally underutilizing technology is in regard to the QME process. You know, uh, please explain. Well, you know, right now we're 
sending pieces of paper around. We get a CUME panel and we mail it uh, for a strike and it's mailed back and, and we send position statements and we're moving records around and, and everything's going in huge stacks of paper. I think all of that could be managed electronically. Uh, the way I would foresee an efficient system is to for the DWC to keep a repository of all of the documents associated with the QME process and all steps in the QME process from cradle to grave. And I think it would make the process a lot more efficient. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you, but I also find it kind of humorous. Now, I don't know about you, but practically every defense attorney where I get their initial letter of representation has that obligatory quote at the bottom, we do not accept service by fax. And then, of course, I'm getting information all the time from them by fax. So they're contradicting themselves. Additionally, and I know you know this, but for the listeners that don't know this, the one part of California law in the labor code where it says right in there that fax is acceptable has to do with utilization review. Yes, and 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 once again, an area where you know our community is lagging way way behind. You know, you can get a sorry, for, you can get an you can get an RFA. You can fax it to the claims examiner on Friday, and if they haven't uh, done their five day uh, accept delay or whatever, they've blown the statute. You're absolutely correct, and and these are areas where we have to streamline the system. Some things, you know, like I just discussed in the QME process, I think can be dealt with uh, on a regulatory basis. Things like you just described in UR and IMR, sadly, I believe is going to require legislation. And having been engaged in the legislative process on a number of occasions, just to say, poof, let's pass a bill, don't expect that to happen very quickly. Let's talk more about that. What's involved with the legislative process? How do you communicate with our legislators? How do you keep track of what the applicants bar want, the, the defense bar wants, and then satisfy everybody? Well, first of all, it's not the applicant and defense bar. It's the, the real parties in this process are labor and management. Okay. And, and not even the insurance companies. The insurance companies are involved to a large degree, but it is labor and management that are communicating with one another. Are you talking about strictly a union environment? Mm, we're talking about the head of the AFL-CIO, also known as the Labor Federation. They're the primary player. We're also talking about heads of the uh, the Teamsters, uh, um, the firefighters are extremely, their unions are but extremely. But what percentage engaged. of the workforce is unionized? Uh, well, yes, but, but, but who's out there that's going to speak on behalf of the, uh, those individuals that aren't organized? So labor actually speaks for everybody. So when they it, step up to the plate then? Well, they have to. And, and so the negotiations you know, will normally take place. You know, bills are introduced right now. There, there's been a slew of bills that were introduced uh, in the legislature. Many of them are what we call spot bills. Uh, spot bills just have a very brief amount of language in it, and they're amended as the session goes on. Now, uh, sometimes these bills are amended, you know, in March or in April and May, and they're debated and in, in, com in assembly committees or Senate committees and eventually get to bills that are voted on, sometimes uh, bills, you know, the, the, the language is negotiated on in the dreaded smoke-filled rooms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, come billowing out at the end of the negotiation process is a bill. Um, you know, I, I was involved in, you know, SB 899 and SB 863. 863. And I could tell you I was in the open quote room of, uh, for a significant part of it, but in both instances, me and a lot of other people were kicked out of the room and weren't, weren't there at the very end of the process when the final language was put together. Well, let me ask you a question then. Um, did you have... Ted, they, a little louder, a little louder. When, when, okay, they kicked you out of the room, but you were, prior to that, you were intimately involved in the process did they take your suggestions or anybody else's suggestions into consideration when the final version came out? Yes and no. Um, and some of it we couldn't control. I mean, when 
SBA 99 was passed and there was, you know, the massive change in the medical legal process with QMEs, I remember getting, you know, during this period when I was kicked out of the room, getting 50, 60 pages of here's the new QME process. What do you think about it? And by the way, get back to me in two hours. (laughs) <laughs> How God. much, in 899 and 863, I, I, a little bird told me that not only Schwarzenegger at the time, but Disneyland and Berkshire Hathaway played a huge role in, in changing the law. Is that true? Berkshire was not involved. Okay. Uh, the There were a number of key employers that were involved that included... Uh, the, Disneyland? Disney, mm-hmm. um, uh, Southern California Edison. Kroger's? Uh, um, no, uh, Safeway, Vons was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I hear the happiest place in the world is not such a happy person to deal with when uh, dealing with legislative changes. Is that true? No, I would push back on that. I, okay. I, I think that uh, you know the, the Disney company has brought to the table some very, very good perspectives. And they're not a client, by the way, but um, they're, they've they been a uh, uh, an appropriate player in the process. Mm-hmm. Let's talk for a moment about the gig economy and independent contractor versus employee. It seems like whenever there's a dispute, I mean 99 out of 100 times, that independent contractor is going to be found to be an employee. However, the exception appears to be Lyft and Uber drivers. And I'm not necessarily talking about going before the WCAB, but the labor commissioner in the state of California, they're cracking down on the truck drivers and the hairdressers, and most recently, of course, the adult entertainers, er, strippers. But um, how come uh, the state of California hasn't cracked down on Uber and Lyft drivers? It seems like the most logical thing to do. Well... It, look, the whole we had a major shift in the world of independent contractor May first when the Dynamex or Dynamics mm-hmm. case came down, which is a labor law case, not a work comp case, and it is and it defines independent contractor under what's known as the ABC test, and mm-hmm. you, you have to qualify. The employer has to meet all three tests. B is if the imputative employee is in the same occupation as the putative employer, then uh, the putative employee is considered to be an employee. Basically, if you can't operate the business without the services of the independent contractor, they are employees. No, it's like uh, it's it, it. if I contract with an attorney to do work for me, no matter how much I want to dress him out to be an independent contractor, He's real. He's really one of my employees. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned beauticians and barbers. Yes. Historically, they rent space, but the barber shop is in the business or the, of providing hairdressing services. So that's going to make them employees. Right. But let's turn to Uber and Lyft. Please. What what Uber and Lyft have been advocating, and this has been you know been, been argued in the courts extensively, is Uber and Lyft saying is we're not in the transportation business. We are in the technology business. All that we do oh. is we provide the platform for accessing the public to access these people that want to provide rides, and they're just the go-between. So that is, and the uh, the interesting part of this whole discussion is, even though the Dynamics case, when you read it, seems to be going after the gig economy mm-hmm. uh, and Uber and Lyft, in reality, they're the ones that might survive uh, Dynamex. Now, that leads us up to legislation. Uh, and I get asked all the time, so what can we expect in 2019 in legislation? Well, interestingly, we're not in workers' comp. I don't think we're going to hear anything other at the end of the day uh, other than Dynamex and privacy. Dynamex, so every, you know, there are multiple aspects of the working community. They don't want to be independent contractors. And there's a lot of members of management that they don't want these people to be, uh, to be their employees. So everybody is lobbying the legislature saying, hey, look at us. Take us out. Uh, we don't want to be involved in this, uh, in this fray. And this legislative process in the next year is going to 
push uh, it's going to be pushing back and forth as to who do we want to include, who do we want to exclude. Mm. And part of this discussion could eventually be workers comp because you know some of the more liberal factions in in the in the assembly uh, have introduced legislation to say, oh, and by the way, let's make the ABC test this the test for workers comp and get rid of the Borello standard. Now, which, which also was a labor case, too, but please continue. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but Dynamex and some holdings of the WCAB have already determined that it, Dynamex or Dynamics does not apply to workers' comp. Borello still applies. But there is going to be discussions to say, hey, while we're taking care of you know, who's going to be taken out, who's going to be kept in as independent contractors, there's going to be a push to include uh, – to the ABC test for the determination of workers' compensation disputes. Right. And, of course, in a couple of years, if Lyft and Uber have it their way, all of their independent contractors are out because they want self-driving cars. And uh, you mentioned earlier about privacy, and also, of course, I want to talk to you about carve-outs and ADRs, but we're going to take a little break for some news. My name is Steve Appel. You're listening to Work Comp Matters. With, we, we are with our special guest, Attorney Saul Allwise. We're brought to you by WorkCompCentral.com. If you want the number one online location for workers' compensation, credits, education, blogging, both in California and around the United States. Check out WorkCompCentral.com. We're also brought to you by A1 Law. If you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system in the damn Kuiper belt, give me a call at 818-357-4120 for your no-strings-attached money-back guarantee. One dollar a day, A1 Law. And last but not least, when I need tickets, I call my buddy Brian at Santa Monica Tickets, 310-395-8587, whether it's front row, sold out, concert sports theater heck it doesn't matter well he's my right hand man he keeps me in check and out of trouble at least 90 percent of the time he's the doctor with the first news story of the night dr michael zyma well this was really a big deal earlier on in this day donald trump's former attorney and fixer michael cohen testified today before the house oversight committee about the president's involvement in hush money payments to women and Russian involvement in the presidential elections. Cohen's testimony dealt mostly with the actions of President Trump and Cohen's financial crimes and past lies to Congress. Cohen also revealed that prosecutors in New York are investigating conversations between Trump and Cohen that occurred after Cohen's office was searched by the FBI in April of 2018. He also explained how Trump instructed him to pay 130000 bucks to Stormy Daniels. Oh, speaking of Stormy Daniels, who would have ever thought that she would be at the forefront talking about independent contractors and employees? What is California coming to? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, I coined the phrase, and I've known him for over 20 years, without question, the best-dressed man in workers' compensation with the next news story, Mr. Ted Durden. 95% of the California DMV funds will soon become insolvent, according to a nonpartisan report published on Tuesday. The Legislative Analyst Office predicts the $2.9 billion motor vehicle account which primarily funds the California Highway Patrol and DMV, will collapse in a few years, according to Anthony Simbol, Deputy Legislative Analyst. We've just been dipping into our reserves, but at some point, the fund will go insolvent. The legislature has to raise fees, provide general fund support, a cut down on expenses. If lawmakers don't take immediate action, DMV customers could soon face longer wait lines. Jesus Christ. (laughs) <laughs> or sizable fee increases when they register their cars, according to symbol. I, 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 I don't understand this. They, they're, you know, they're, they're the only game in town. They're the only game in town. They, uh, they should be more like the state fund. I mean, the state fund always shows a profit. But then again, they're not funded by tax dollars. It's all, of the, it's all the employers that contribute I mean, to the I mean, state who, fund. Who, who else gets the registration money? Who, who else gets all of that? The, the, li- the license fees, all of that, it goes to them. So how, how the hell are they going broke? Well, do you think they're wasting dough, just throwing well, it away? Okay, well, well I, 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 I would say mismanaged. But. Well, yeah, I remember years ago, and it was, um, what was the name of the, the firm? Um, 
Deloche and Tooch. Deloitte and Tooch. Yeah, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. They were hired by DMV <laughs> to create this program for them. They paid them $40 million, and it never worked. It never worked. They ended up scrapping it, just scrapping it. Well, you know, so, we talked about ADR before, and I'll tell you about a workforce that would be, be perfect for ADR, and that's the California Highway, Hi, California Highway Patrol. We want to talk about ADR in just a moment, but right now, he is now the self-proclaimed madman across the water. 45-year workers' compensation attorney, retired, hanging out in Munich, Germany, with his regular segment on Work Comp Matters, John Scalia. Hi, this is John, the madman across the water, with a weekly report from Munich. In the beginning, we will have our Trump take. This week, it was learned that Donald Trump's heel spur has miraculously been cured, and for the first time since he is 18, he is free to go to Vietnam, meet with the leader of North Korea, and declare that he has made the world safe from nuclear weapons. Secondly, this is the fifth anniversary of Pope Benedict's resignation as Pope from the head of being the head of the Roman Catholic Church. As it turned out, that was one of the most brilliant moves in history. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church has paid four billion, that's billion with a B, dollars in settlement of sex abuse scandals. We're going to talk about that. The Pope, well, first I want to go back to my own personal relationship with the Roman Catholic Church, because I believe in full disclosure. Being Italian, I was destined to be baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, and I was. I was also educated by the Roman Catholic Church up until university. I went to a Catholic elementary school and to a Jesuit prep school in San Francisco. I actually like the Jesuits. In fact, I went to a Jesuit university in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara, I'm fond, of, fond enough of it to have mentioned it and uh, provided a scholarship to the school in my will. So I don't have any personal animus against the Roman Catholic Church or any particular priestly order of the Roman Catholic Church. I am, in fact, an objective observer. Now, what am I observing? Well, this week, the Pope has just concluded a conference in Rome about the sex abuse scandals. That's the new Pope, Francis. It's a big dog and pony show. Francis expresses his regret about all the sexual abuse that's happened and said it's terrible, and they're going to institute reforms to make sure it doesn't happen again. Ah, there's the kicker. What do they mean by reforms? Well, as it turns out, they mean nothing. Because any objective observer would say, well, if you want reforms, you're going to have to have institutional reforms. Let's begin with the core problem. The core problem is that the Roman Catholic Church has as a, as a requirement for its clergy that they be one, male, and two, celibate. Now, this is intriguing because the Roman Catholic Church is a big proponent of what's called the natural law. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas was the alleged philosopher who is the big proponent of natural law. Well, if you look around you, you will see that celibacy is not natural. If you look in the animal kingdom, it's certainly not natural. And if you look in the human kingdom, it is certainly not natural. So what we know is that the requirement to become a minister in the Roman Catholic Church violates the natural law of which they are a proponent. There are consequences for this, and the consequences have become painfully obvious. First of all, even though you tell people they can't have sex, guess what? Yes. And since you tell people that they can't have heterosexual sex, you also provide a convenient place for pedophiles and closet homosexuals to hide. This is no judgment on being a homosexual. It's just a sociological fact. Plus, these people are surrounded by children of both sexes. So the inevitable occurs. Lots of sex, lots of abuse. Now, this is not limited to clergy, nor is it limited to Catholic clergy. However, the amount of abuse in Protestant denominations is way, way less. Why? Very simply because they allow clergy to marry. And so if you want to be married, you have sex and you can still be a minister. Not so in the Roman Catholic Church. As I said, they have paid $4 billion in, as a result of priests abusing their authority. 
So the Pope is saying, well, we're sorry, we're going to change. And he handed out a document to the bishops and, and cardinals, which had three recommendations on it. I am not making this up. One, mandatory codes of conduct for priests. Two, training people to spot abuse. Three, informing the police. This is what he calls reform. One, mandatory codes of conduct for priests. You mean somewhere along the way to ordination, they weren't told, by the way, giving up sex means you don't have sex? Or they weren't told, by the way, being in a position of authority means not abusing the authority? Or they were not told, by the way, don't have sex with minors? Huh. Somehow this is a reform. Second thing, train people to spot abuse. I won't even deal with that because obviously whether or not you're dealing with the average person or trained professional, the question is who gets the training, who does the training, it's too problematical. And the third thing, inform the police. Wow, what a reform that is. A crime has been committed. Call the cops. You must be Albert Einstein to figure that one out. Well, as you can see, I believe that what went on in Rome is a dog and pony show. The Roman Catholic Church is not committed to any type of institutional reform, which is the only type of reform which will stop this kind of abuse. So it will continue going on. Yep, that's the report this week from the madman across the sea. Uh, and John, uh, that's madman across the water. But uh, thank you very much. My name is Steve Appel. You're dialed into Work Comp Matters. We're with our special guest, Attorney Saul Allweiss. And of course, we're brought to you by WorkCompCentral.com. If you want the number one online location for workers' compensation, blogging, credits, education, the whole ball of wax, check out WorkCompCentral.com. And if you want the number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the planet, give me a call at 818 357 4120 for your no strings attached money back guarantee, $1 a day, A1 law. And if you want those hard to get sold out, even front row, Concert, sports, theater tickets. Give our buddy Brian a call at Santa Monica Tickets. 310-395-8587. Saul, before the break, uh, we said we were going to talk to you uh, about privacy as well as uh, uh, ADR and carve-outs. Go ahead and pick one and take the lead. Well, a ADR is right. uh, you know, and a concept that has been around for oh, close to 20 years now. And about 5% of all workers' compensations, give or take, cases are in the ADR. Yeah, yeah. But, but there's increasing interest in it because it saves money for, it saves time and money for uh, employers and it speeds up the delivery of benefits to injured workers. So unions are becoming more and more interested in entering into ADR programs. So that would require a union environment. Yeah. In order to get into ADR, the unions have to engage in the collective bargaining process with management to say, hey, we want to, uh, we jointly want to create an ADR program. So it requires a union. Without a union, there's no carve out. Correct. Okay. So, the, like, you know, I, I was very involved in creating the Safeway ADR, also known as Vons here in Southern California. And the Vons ADR only involves one union, UFCW. It doesn't involve Teamsters. It doesn't involve the Bakers. So, and it doesn't involve the number, you know, quite a few employees that aren't, uh, aren't union members at all. It only involves UFCW workers. So tell us uh, some of the similarities and some of the differences of the benefits involved in the carve-out versus your standard workers' compensation. Well, so the uh, you have a blank slate on ADR with the only limitation being you can't reduce benefits. So you can't reduce TD, PD. You can't go to a medical program where injured workers would have to pay deductibles uh, or co-pays. Uh, but anything else is whatever you want to do. So usually ADRs include their own litigation system, which involves mediators and, uh, and arbitrators instead of judges and long lines of the WCAB. Most ADRs have an agreed list of medical evaluators, so you don't have to deal with the QME process. There are it's a list of doctors that management and labor have agreed to. Uh, tell tell us uh, the definition of an ombudsman and how that is different from, say, a workers' compensation judge or whatnot. Yeah, an ombudsman is the administrator for the program. So the ombudsman might have a quasi-mediator type of role, but really she he or she is the administrator. 
So when dispute, the, they're the front line of intervention when any type of dispute happens. Uh, on a non-litigated case, the injured worker says, why did they cut off my TD? The, they call the ombudsman. The ombudsman's going to call the examiner and get to the bottom of it. And, and therefore, there is no ex parte communication with an ombudsman. Uh, well, there, there is ex parte communication. Uh, uh, pardon uh, me, there uh, is. Yeah. It, it's allowed, yeah. Yeah, and like with mediation, uh, I, I believe ex parte communication is encouraged. Uh, that way I can get, as a mediator, get to the bottom of things by hearing the, the unvarnished truth from both sides. Um, is there any difference in the ADR rules and regs versus the work comp uh, ADR rules and regs once you go on the record and the court reporter's there? Uh, oh, you're talking about it at arbitration? No, it, okay. it's... Uh, you, you can't change that. So uh, the, if, if you're actually going to trial, it's the same exact uh, scenario. Now, I, I think I've been doing workers' comp for close to 30 years. I've had two carve-out cases. Of course, they were both with you. But uh, I, is there something about Monrovia where a lot of hearings are held in Monrovia? Right. Because your office is in Encino, but a lot of the carve-outs are held in Monrovia. What's up with Monrovia? I have no idea. Oh, okay. And actually, uh, that was a great question, though, because I, I, I wonder the same thing, the exact same thing. And actually, I try to encourage mediations to occur in my office. Of course, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah, sure. And uh, then um, also privacy. Uh, what's what's going on with privacy? We were talking off the air, and you say some heavy duty stuff is coming down. Yeah, last July, um, the uh, legislature and the governor enacted into law the California Consumer Privacy Act, known as the CCPA. And it's a sweeping and probably very appropriate privacy bill, noting that all the problems that we've seen uh, with you know individuals' privacy being threatened, social media, uh, you know the, well, what we saw with Facebook last year, things yep. like that. But um, there might be, there not might be, there are some significant unintended consequences. And in our workers' comp world, a very, very significant unintended consequence. And that is injured workers are probably going to be, de- as the bill reads right now, they're going to be defined as consumers, which conceivably really? could oh. require uh, everybody in the system applicants, attorneys, defense attorneys, utilization review companies, IMR companies, bill review companies, anybody that touches the case might have to be sending out notice to consumers to the injured worker in regard to every single transaction. Right. So let's let's stop right there. You know, we Mike and I work in the same office. Mostly we represent injured workers. And amongst the 12 other things that we have our clients sign when we first comes in is a release of medical records. And then, of course, we used, we, we photocopy that sucker and we send it out throughout the life of the case. What you're saying is not only us, but anybody who even touches a medical report is going to have to file and serve some type of authorizing document every time, even if they get a, a PR2, right? Possibly. Possibly, yeah. And as a result, the the workers' comp world, but a lot of other sectors of the economy are lobbying the legislature saying, hey, we know you intended to do the right thing, but there are some unintended consequences as a result. And you're going to see some legislation pass that sometime this session, the CCPA doesn't go into effect until January 1st, 2020. Now, on the privacy thing, and maybe we'll close with this. Now, Ted mostly represents lien claimants. His clients are, are mostly lien claimants. And we had the issue that came up, or the law that came up a few years ago, where for a lien claimant who is not a medical doctor, correct, um, he has that, that party has to petition to get the complete medical file before uh, uh, before getting the medical records. Now, I want to ask Ted and then Saul, have you ever had a situation where you did not petition and then the defense comes into the lien trial with the complete medical file to use as evidence? Hey, wait a minute. You never served it on me. That's not admissible. That doesn't work. And, okay. I'll, and I'll tell you why. Please do. Well, it's arguable as far as if a petition is necessary because the actual reading of the language in the statute says the defendants are not allowed to serve any medicals on a non-physician provider unless ordered to do so by the court. Now, there are some judges 
that believe that all they have to do is issue a minute order. And there are some that do. Now, the statute lays out if you do prepare a petition for medicals, there are certain guidelines that you have to follow. And the most common one is you have to make sure that you serve the applicant's attorney, make sure you serve the applicant, and of course, the insurance company and any defense firm. So that so that that's arguable. Now, if you don't petition a defendant or if a judge doesn't issue a minute order, there is nothing to stop a defendant when they show up at trial with all the medical evidence and you don't have squat. You're you're ju- you're just ass out of luck because you didn't do what you would ne- what was necessary. You did not attempt to conduct any discovery. So they're not barred from introducing any evidence at all. Saul, does Ted speak the truth? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> and and but the, we're, let's factor in the CCPA to this. So I'm ordered to turn over my medical file or certain documents. I have to send, and you see notice to consumers in every subpoena. I would have to send Correct. something similar to that to the injured worker. And what happens if this is, you know, a guy that lives out in the desert and, and all of a sudden has a burr up his butt about, you know, I don't want this stuff going on. He so says, the I worker, object. The injured worker can object. Possibly. Nobody ever objects to On these what things. basis? Though? Wait, wait. Oh, no, no, but no, no. Just understand, this has nothing to do with whether there's merit to it. It has to do with... If you fail to do it, Mm -hmm. then a bunch of injured workers can come up with a class action suit and say, hold on, our rights have been trampled on. But I got I I got I just have to share a funny since you said that's never happened. There's a judge whose name. No, don't get don't give the name. Just tell what happened. Okay, he had a he had a workers comp claim. And when it came time after this case was adjudicated and was settled and everything was done, of course, then you had the providers and the non-physician providers who are petitioning for the medicals. Well, this judge would show up in the, at every hearing and object to any petition because he did not want people who had appeared before him to know what his ailments were, what his medical condition was. He simply did not. Now, now at, one point, at some point, there were some judges that got very royaled. Because they said, look, you're interfering with a, a non-physician provider who you benefited from, from, from prosecuting their lien. You, you, you can't, you simply can't. So they, there was some arm twisting that was involved. But yes, it did happen and sometimes it does happen. So there can be absurd results. So. Oh, yeah. And the absurd result is that um, you, know, you, you fail to send the appropriate notice out. The injured worker gets word of it gets wind of this four years later and files a lawsuit. And, you know, none of this has to do with winning a lawsuit. What this has to do with is defending a lawsuit. Saul, we we spoke earlier uh, about uh, the Don Tobin interview using technology to evaluate a file. You're still clearly old school. You're in the paper. Do you feel that, like, the technology has lessened the ability of the newer attorneys to, quote, evaluate evidence, close quote. Clearly they know the law, at least I think they know the law, but I'm not sure if, if they're, they're losing something in the technological process. Well, what's your take? Do, do, do attorneys you meet, do they have a problem evaluating the evidence? I, I see that problem when I'm at the board, when I'm dealing with a co-defendant or an applicant's attorney that's working off a of computer and all of a sudden they're frantically you know, paging through their laptop to find something very specific. Now, I understand, and again, I'm a dinosaur, I understand that the technology is such that you can put you know, virtual sticky notes um, on documents, and I guess that's the way to get past that, but I, I got to admit, I'm not there myself. Is it the younger practitioners that you see do this? Yeah, I would oh. think it has to be. Oh, yes. yeah. I, I, would, I would think so, and, and I agree I agree with you, Saul, because I, it, I've, I've worked on both sides. I've tried doing that on a computer. I hate it. I hate it. I'm old school like you. Give me a physical file so I can tab and highlight areas that I think that are going to be pertinent mm-hmm. To my case, yep. that if a judge asks a question, I can go directly to it. In quote, chapter and verse, I can point to it. But on a computer, 
it, it's just too hard because you're skimming through documents. Even if you put the virtual post-it notes on it, it doesn't always pop out. It just doesn't. You know, Steve, we have an interesting hybrid, and it works just fine for us. Well, I was saying earlier, we are a semi-paperless system. I love the computer in the office, but I never bring a laptop to court. I always bring my paper to file to court with the tabs. I bring my computer notes Mm -hmm. so I can look through the computer notes, but I never bring the computer. That lends me to another question. Um, Depositions both uh, applicant and doctors. Let, let's start with deposing the applicant first because you're a defense attorney. A uh, couple of tricks of the trade for the listeners. What do, you, what do you always do? What do you never do? Well, always is the appropriate word to yeah. avoid. Uh, there, I don't think there's anything more frustrating to an applicant's attorney to sit there and watch a defense attorney go through a 200-page canned, bre- uh, canned deposition set of questions. You have to plan in advance what is it that you want to get out of this deposition and how are you going to get there. The other aspect is discipline. And i got to admit, I'm not, I've got associates that are far more disciplined than I uh, in taking depositions. What do you mean by that? What is discipline in taking a deposition? Discipline means that if on the fifth question in you hit pay dirt and and get something that is really really interesting yeah, uh-huh. well i'll give a perfect anecdote sure. my, my uh, associate marla kelly who i think takes one of the best depositions around um you know like 20 questions into this deposition the standard question have you ever been incarcerated yes and all of a sudden it went on to an hour and a half finding out how this gentleman had done three terms in Leavenworth and two somewhere else and had all types of altercations while in jail. And it it, it took her an hour just by making this right turn to a question that Mm -hmm. normally would be no No, and go on to the next question. The discipline is, can you go on to your sixth question Uh, and not just say, okay, let's just go, you know, 40 questions in because that's the discipline I'm talking about. What do you think about deposing doctors? Now, let me tell you, I don't know if you ever worked with my dad, 30-year retired applicant attorney. He told me a long time ago when deposing a doctor, and, and I apply this also to trials, the three Bs, begin, be brief, and be seated. What are your secrets to deposing a doctor? Deposing a doctor, again, you have to have a plan. And my first approach is, okay, what is it that I want to you know, what are the points in the doctor's report I want him to change? Right. So my first plan of action is, can I change the doctor's mind? And then my second backup plan is impeach the doctor and make his report. So ridiculous. You're going to have a good chance to get it thrown out. Exactly. Uh, Dad always told me that there's two ways to get a doctor to change his mind. One is to show him new evidence. Because what doctor wants to sign under penalty of perjury uh, this objective finding, this subjective finding, this whole person impairment, and then have an attorney come in and say, oops, I made a mistake. You know, So if you show him new information, it saves face. The other way to do it is to propose hypotheticals that hopefully you can prove up at trial. And then the doctor might say, well, if a workers' compensation judge uh, says that this is fact, then I would change my opinion. Yeah, and I use hypotheticals quite a bit. Now, if my opponent's using hypotheticals, and usually when I propose hypotheticals, we're both going to start objecting that this is an incomplete hypothetical. And and at the end of the day, you're going to have to stop using hypotheticals and get back to the facts of the case. And one of the things that I, you know, I, I tell my associates all the time is don't ignore objections. Uh, because if the objection is not, you know, it, if the objection has some meaning to it, hypothetical, uh, compound, you better do something to clean up the question somewhere down the road. Otherwise, if that deposition transcript is ever attempted to be introduced in evidence, the judge will rule on the objection at trial, and perhaps the testimony that you get is, you know, may not be necessarily be admissible th- later down the road. Now, many times I take a deposition to try to convince my opponent why I should try to settle the case. So I really don't care about all the hypotheticals I'm asking and whether or not those objections are going to be ruled on in my favor down the road. I'm really more looking at, can I get something out of the doctor that I can then go to applicant's attorney afterwards and say, let's talk and settle this case. 
you spoke about opponents, and I started off in your introduction saying that doing my research, I mean, everybody likes you, man. What, firstly, what is your secret? And clearly, that has to help you get a little bit more money than, say, another defense attorney who say, I don't like. So what's your secret to everybody liking you, and does that help you uh, get what uh, will save your client money is what I meant. Well, I've always tried to treat people uh, with, with with respect. I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and I, you know, I don't lose my temper. I, I, I can say that I, I lose How my temper. How do you do that? I lose my temper once a decade or so. You don't want to be around when it happens, okay? Well, what if you're being presented with BS and the other side just doesn't get it? I just calmly continue to make my points mm -hmm. and uh, and grit my teeth. I now I like it. There's a few times I've lost it, but I really mm -hmm. can count them maybe on both hands. I have lost my temper a lot more, more earlier in my career than later. I believe in the last couple of years I've learned to control it a little more. If my opponent or someone is saying something ridiculous, I will probably like lower my head, bite my tongue, wait for them to finish. I'll start up again. They'll interrupt me, say something stupid. I'll lower my head again. But I think in the past couple of years, I've, I've gotten better at biting my tongue. The other thing that I do that I think has garnered a lot of respect is I treat my cases very realistically. And evaluating if, evidence. Yes. Again. And if I and and I am a small practice, small practitioner for a very good reason. I don't want to be I want to be able to pick my clients. So I choose to represent defendants, employers and insurers that realistically look at their cases as well. I pride myself on the fact that, you know, if I'm going to trial, it's either because I got a very distinct legal issue mm -hmm. Uh, or I have an applicant's attorney, or usually not so much an applicant's attorney, an injured worker that just doesn't want to listen to reason. Um, every other case really should be settled. We're, we're supposed to be a dispute resolution system. We're not designed to be a litigation system. An expedited system. benefit delivery system. Yeah. So, so the adjusters that you deal with, for the most part, are experienced. Yes, and I also, because of my work in legislation, I have access to management, and um, now I don't go around examiners on a routine basis, but if we're talking about big cases, um, I will go up the food chain and get to the appropriate person. Do you tell that adjuster, listen, we've had the conversation, I've given you a recommendation, you're not agreeing with it, I just want to put you on notice, I'm going to need to discuss this with the supervisor, or do you just do it without letting them know? I, well, I try not to do the latter, yeah, okay. but, but yeah. uh, for the most part, you know, it, it's it's done in a team approach. I, I, I get the examiner to probably agree, you know, I think this has to go up to management. You know, speaking of dealing with examiners, and uh, you can feel free to say it's none of my business, but how much whining and dining do you do? Absolutely none. Really? Okay, because I, I know a couple of statewide law firms where I know for a fact they've picked up claims managers at the airport in Southern California flew them up to Northern California, put them in a hotel, dinner, show, whatever other accoutrement they might be interested, and then fly them back the next day. You do zero whining and dining. And actually, it's the exact opposite. If I have uh, dinner with a client, I'm having dinner with a client on Monday mm -hmm. night, she's going to pick up the tab. She will not let me touch it. How about that? Wow. Uh, I, yeah, I, I would think that uh, most of your clients probably just say, Saul, I trust you. Just make sure you got it in writing what you're going to do and it's authorized. Yeah, and, and also, you know, I try to specialize. That specialize. I like catastrophic injuries. Mm -hmm. and Why? It, well, because you're putting somebody's life back together mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. trying to. Um, and, and in dealing with a catastrophic claim, I'm actually dealing with the highest levels of management. I'm dealing with the reinsurers or excess And the insurers. most amount of money. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of interesting to put those types of cases together. They're, they make for interesting puzzles. How do you find the dealings with the reinsurers? 
Uh, good, good question. Though. Actually, pretty if a lot reinsurers and excess insurers are for the most part easier to deal with many times than the primary insurers uh, because they they are looking more at the big picture and they are looking at you know uh, very hard at, at the reserves that they might have to be setting aside for decades for th- those types of cases. Do you ever deal with Lloyd's? Uh, yeah, I've seen them on cases. Yeah. Saul, there's been talk for years now about the CT claim going away. Is that ever going to happen? I doubt it. Now, are we the only state in the union that has the CT claim? No, there are other states uh, that have CTs, uh, but uh, the the types of CTs that we see here in California, uh, especially in Southern California, are far different than you see anywhere else in the country. Um, athletes sports claims. Uh, I have minimal to none experience in that, but I do my best to keep up. What's the latest on uh, uh, workers' compensation athletes sport claims, especially with uh, um, uh, teams that are based outside of California? Minimum contact stuff. Uh, yeah, minimum mm-hmm. contact rule. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, well, the pendulum has been swinging to be more conservative. Mm-hmm finding um, more a lot of athletes to not be considered to be employees. Um, really? Yeah. And well, I thought it was a jurisdictional issue. Well, it is, uh, but it's jurisdictional, but they're finding, it, it, uh, as Mike mentioned, that the minimum, they're putting a higher standard to prove the minimum contacts. So oh. if you have a guy that only uh, played two games in California out of a career uh, in other states, they're, you know, there's a good chance you might get out of uh, that, 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 that team might get out of a case. What process do you use to value future medical? I, I am finding lately that the value of future medical, or at least what I'm offered, has been going down and down. And I've been telling my clients, hey, you know what? Let's leave your future medical open. You're 40 years old. You've got a 40-year life uh, free uh, uh, medical policy. I want you to see the treating doctor every 90 days for the rest of your life until it's put out. Even if the doctor said, you know, you're fine, there's, you know, you don't need any treatment. I want him seeing the doc every 90 days. How do you value your future medical? You have to, you have to pencil out what is the potential exposure, what type of complications can occur down the road, and, uh, and, and put together what you believe, you know, might occur, you know, in, over the overall case, uh, handling of the case. Do you find that <laughs> in the last 10 years, carriers are more likely to let the future medical ride and just see if you are can take care of it? Yes and no. I, once again, I, I go to my clients that I, I've picked and they tend to, they recognize that um, the only good case is a settled case. And even if you have things like UR and IMR as controls, at the end of the day, other things can happen. The injured worker is hypertensive and diabetic and those things come into play. Oh, or yeah. or if it's a very, if it's a severe injury and while there's no need for home care now, is there going to be a need for home care five years, ten years from now? Right. And when you start penciling out home care, that minimum amount eighteen for unskilled care, eighteen dollars an hour, um, at one hour a day times, uh, you know, times three hundred sixty-five days a year times eighteen years, wow. Scott, what's our time, please? Okay. Wow. Let's talk about apportionment for a moment. Recent case, I believe it's the Petaluma case. Lind, yes. Yeah, uh, which had to do. Well, w- w- what can you tell us briefly about the Petaluma case? Well, in in Lind, uh, we're we're getting down to the basics of what SB eight ninety nine was about. That the employer is only going to be charged with that portion of the permanent disability was that was directly caused by the workplace. Uh, this was initially you know, discussed by the Supreme Court in the Welcher Brody case, where uh, you know that you know initially in Escobedo, then in, in Welcher Brody, and uh, and then you know, expanded even further in the Rice versus City of Jackson case. So Lind is I don't think is anything really new. Lind actually emphasizes Escobedo 
uh, and Brody by saying, you know, we're only going to char- charge the employer what was directly caused by the workplace. And most importantly, we are going to take into account asymptomatic conditions. Uh, new term that I heard recently, uh, swag. Uh, something wild ass guess. Is it stupid wild ass guess? Uh, yeah, stupid Some, wild ass guess. Okay. So apportionment arguably can be a stupid wild uh, stupid wild ass guess right uh i've seen doctors that have confronted me saying you know it, it's absolutely ridiculous that you can say 10 percent versus 15 percent versus 20 percent but most of the medical community has learned to get past that and i and we get down to uh, best estimates, uh, right. and and that's where we usually end up with getting a doctor to make conclu- conclusions. And that is going to end up the show. We are out of time. Such a pleasure to have you here, Attorney uh, Saul Allweiss. Thank you very much. I hope you know later on in the year, whatnot, you'll come back uh, for Scott Walton of Uncle Studio for the best dressed man, Ted Durden. For the doctor, Michael Zima, attorney Saul Allweis, retired attorney John Scalia, and all the good people back at WorkComp Central that continue to support and approve of this project, including, but not limited to, Ms. Christine Chavez. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you back again next week with a special guest, uh, John McNeely, on another edition of WorkComp Matters.